Thank you so much. Good morning, uh, everyone. We uh, had uh, some very lively discussions in the energy, climate, technology and environmental uh, workshop. Um, the scene was set by a framing question, which is uh, how do we basically uh, develop uh, trajectories, policies, investment strategies that help to, to bridge and to meet the different objectives at the same time, which are energy security, sustainability, competitiveness, acceptability, and of course, uh, last but not least, uh, affordability. And um, we started by taking stock of where the global energy situation is as we spoke and as we, we meet today. Um, we came out of one of the worst uh, energy multi-crisis, polycrisis actually, which has left uh, the Europeans probably the largest uh, global losers. And, uh, but not also to forget about how uh, a number of emerging economies were deeply affected by the rise in uh, energy prices, the shortage in uh, LNG, and the need often and regrettably either to reduce supplies to end consumption ends, hence energy access often to the population, but also the need to switch to more carbon intensive fuels such as uh, heavy fuel oil or coal uh, in energy systems. Um, talking about Europe, uh, clearly Europe was the most affected uh, the brutal decoupling from energy supplies from Russia led to soaring energy costs. The Europeans were able to rebalance towards the LNG market thanks to siphoning off, in a way, uh, available spot LNG and, and a lot of uh, LNG from the US that was typically geared to the Atlantic Basin, Latin America, or Asia, of course, was directed to Europe. On the other hand, there was a, a drop in demand in Europe, which also helped to pass these uh, difficult moments, and governments intervened at very, very heavy cost uh, to alleviate uh, the burden of uh, rising uh, energy prices and the uh, burden on uh, populations. Now, that being said, um, I think it's also important to note that this will have structural consequences because huge debts were created uh, and uh, which uh, have to be reimbursed in times of uh, uh, increasing interest rates or high interest rates uh, on the one hand and on the other hand the issue of uh, acceptability by European population of an accelerated uh, energy transition and their, the ability of population to uh, basically uh, sustain higher costs and lower purchasing power uh, is now in question. Um, we also touched upon the fact that um, uh, we now have huge price differences between Europe and uh, the other OECD competitors, and this will pose uh, structural and systemic competitiveness uh, issues moving forward uh, if we have uh, energy prices that are three to four times higher than what we see in the US, for example. Um, we, we moved on also to discuss the global energy picture and uh, especially a few weeks ahead of COP and what is striking there is that, and you're all familiar with that, but global energy demand is rising sharply and, and that is not only related to the growth in the renewables or electricity, it is still also relying on the fossil fuels. We have now global oil demand that has topped 100 million barrels per day, and that will by year end mean an increase of 2 million barrels per day versus last year. So this is a sharp increase. And if you consider that you have a natural depletion rate of oil fields in the world of 4%, it means that you have to add 6 million barrels per day of new production in a world where, in principle, if we listen to science, we are to uh, phase out uh, fossil fuels and, of course, reduce demand accordingly and, and go down to 1.5 degrees. Now, that being said, there is an interesting development, which is that Total Energy's outlooks 
uh, I in um, shared the approach uh, and the view of the IEA, which both and both see that oil demand is expected to peak around 2030 and then progressively decrease. And if we are in a 1.5 degree scenario, there will still be oil. Most likely, we're got not going to hit that. So at the end of the in the middle century we would still have um, some some something between 40 and, and 60 million barrels per day of oil demand which will require of course sustained uh, investment so then we moved on to discuss coal coal clearly on the rise over the past two years because of the energy shocks but there is a fundamental good news still which is that we saw an influx of natural gas in, in the number of emerging economies, but also in, in, of course, in the OECD. And natural gas has helped to reduce the share of coal and power generation and has helped, hence, to reduce the greenhouse gas emission increase from the energy sector. So uh, there were clear figures on that. And most probably, uh, when the when gas prices uh, decelerate uh, in the coming years, we will have again a, a positive trend in this uh, direction. Um, an interesting fact also for all of you to note is that the energy shocks have accelerated the globalization of natural gas markets. We now have a growing share of LNG trade rather than pipeline trade and that is of course related to to russia's uh, pipeline exports to europe uh, largely uh, diminishing um i think it's also interesting to remark that we are all witnessing the the rise of renewables and the iea has put some remarkable numbers out of how much solar pv is actually aligned with 1.5 degrees is an incredible boom which is expected to continue nonetheless the share of renewables in, in total primary energy supply remains uh, uh, largely uh, remains largely insufficient if we are to be on track for 1.5 degrees and the global energy system is still dominated by fossil fuels um, we uh, discussed uh, also uh, what this means for a global energy major like uh, Total Energies and we heard uh, that basically already now one third of the capex is devoted not to fossil fuels but to what they call integrated power and all the low carbon molecules and electrons uh, and two thirds are still uh, on uh, hydrocarbons but a clear focus towards natural gas and and what was uh, uh, remarkable is that obviously there are very very strong efforts that are paid within that company to uh, reduce fugitive methane emissions, to stop flaring, and basically to improve the carbon footprint of uh, oil and gas production, notably for electrification of processes and an improvement of, uh, of all this. Um, and, and of course, uh, what will matter, and especially at COP, is that it is not just the one or two or three companies that are best in, in, in the class in this aspect, but that this uh, spreads out to the entire industry and notably uh, in uh, national oil companies and, 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 and oil producing countries uh, in the OPEC uh, region. Um, we uh, also uh, discussed uh, the role, of course, of electricity, which uh, is uh, one of the largest source of increase in, in, in total primary energy supply. And, and if we look at electricity, uh, of course, renewables are front runners, but the, the, the key issue now is to provide flexibility and, flex and to develop flexibility tools for electricity systems and, of course, also to invest into grids. And that comes at a cost, that comes, uh, there is no magic solutions for that, but uh, it will uh, play an increasing role uh, as we move forward. Um, we also then moved on to discuss some specific regions and Russia and the former Soviet Union countries of Central Asia. And obviously, we heard that uh, uh, they are also uh, interested in, uh, into you know, becoming more sustainable and putting in place uh, regulation and policies that uh, can lead them to that. And I think that was very encouraging. Even in Russia, you still have uh, 
uh, companies and stakeholders and support uh, to, to push uh, for decarbonisation and to improve uh, companies' records in this field. And, um, and, uh, and overall, uh, it, that will probably be one of the aspects post-war uh, on which uh, relations could somehow um, be reinstated. Um, finally, uh, I'd like to mention one major issue in the discussion which uh, is related to the global energy governance and uh, the kind of recognition that uh, the climate and energy transition discussion is too much uh, northern hemisphere centered, it's too much European, has a too strong European footprint and actually leaves uh, large emerging economies like India, for example, uh, uh, largely uh, out of the table. And, um, and with completely different interests. Uh, not to say that uh, India is not concerned about climate change, etc. But the point is that there is a view in, in some of these emerging economies that the Europeans have a kind of uh, climate extremist approach to issues and that they do not recognize what are the challenges that these countries face, notably energy access, uh, the need to respond to soaring energy demand and the fact that uh, uh, there are uh, often no alternatives immediately available uh, to develop energy systems than also uh, fossil fuels, not to mention, of course, concerns over energy security, which are overwhelming in many countries, uh, in the, in the, in the, uh, notably in, in Southeast Asia, but also in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And, and, and unfortunately, we didn't have time to really get deep into the discussion on how to bridge uh, these, uh, these tensions. But uh, nonetheless, I think there was a strong insistence paid on that. And overall, uh, there is a clear, there is a clear uh, uh, sign that we need to work more towards a talking and engaging uh, with the, the Europeans, India, Sub-Saharan African countries uh, over these issues. Uh, and, and fundamentally to address uh, the fundamental uh, aspect of a just uh, energy transition or of just energy transitions, because there is not one, one pathway, one model, especially one that uh, would be designed and modeled uh, by the Europeans, but that there's, uh, there will be different pathways. And, um, and last but not least, I think related to that, uh, uh, the issue which was also touched up in the, in the previous, in the former panel, which is how do we provide liquidity and financial resources to, the, to many of the emerging economies, which are basically um, deprived of access to capital markets and, and which cannot uh, roll out those low carbon technologies simply because the, the borrowing costs uh, are too high. So I think um, uh, we had a good conversation around these aspects and uh, definitely a lot of uh, things to develop uh, and discuss further uh, next year uh, when we reconvene. I thank you for your attention.